Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's Better Managers Briefing. I'm Anne Franca, the Chief Executive of the CMI. And actually today we are going to be celebrating a new chapter in the Better Managers Briefing approach. And what we'll be talking about is uh, CMI's 75th anniversary. That's right, we are 75. We were founded in 1947. Um, so our 75th is coming up next year, and of course, we're going to celebrate it. Uh, here to discuss how we're going to be doing that and how you can get involved are Adam Marshall, CMI's Senior Advisor, and Daisy Hooper, CMI's Head of Policy. Welcome to both of you. Great so, to be with you, Adam. Adam, let's maybe start with you. Um, so what are we up to for our 75th anniversary? And, and, and why is it so important at this juncture for uh, taking a look at modern leadership? Well, and if you think about it, when CMI was founded 75 years ago, it was right in the aftermath of the Second World War and a really strong mission and vision to get the management skills that the UK needs. And in a sense, we're coming out of a similarly transformative period now as we come to the end of the pandemic. Uh, and management and leadership is going to have to change yet again here in the United Kingdom. And CMI can really play a transformative role in that. Uh, if you look at what we're now seeing, uh, we've had this great reshaping of how so many of us work. Uh, we've seen the great resignation, many people seeking change and better purpose and balance in their working lives. I don't know if you feel the same, but I feel we're seeing the biggest competition for talent that I can recall in my working life um, as businesses look and organizations look to bring great people in. Um, and at the same time, we have a new generation in the workforce who have really high expectations of what their employers do, how their leaders and managers act, mm -hmm. and not just on workplace issues, but on wider societal issues and their commitment to community as well. And if you add to all of that, this complex business environment we're facing where things are changing very rapidly and everyone's having to adjust their behavior accordingly, it's quite a different time and the requirements for leadership for the rest of the 21st century really have changed. Um, so anyone with leadership responsibilities in any company or organization, whether it's small, medium sized or large, is, is facing a different future. And that's why this 75th anniversary of CMI is such an important moment. Uh, and the project and the work that we're trying to do is to look at what 21st century management and leadership can be like in that environment and how we get the best out of an ever more diverse, more exciting workforce by working together. Yeah, I think uh, very well said and summed up. Daisy, what are some of the themes we'll be exploring as part of this? So uh, as part of this, we're looking particularly at cha the changing ways of work and um, how inclusivity and diversity can help organizations to build back better, if I'm using the jargony terms that everyone talks about in the press. Um, you know, we know from our research and lots of other research that uh, having a diverse workforce, diversity of thought can help to make organizations more resilient. Um, it can help to find new and creative um, solutions to some of the challenges that Adam mentioned. So, you know, great uncertainty, um, 
you know, increase remote working and that sort of thing. Um, and just help to build a better workplace culture and opportunities so that we can benefit from um, the, the, you know, huge diversity of talent that we have in this country. And I think this project as, as well is about, um, you know, the role that managers and leaders within organizations have um, in, in playing a, a you know a, having a positive effect on that I guess and and contributing in practical ways to to supporting those efforts yeah now it's interesting because you've both talked about the impact of COVID on the trends in, in management and leadership and of course um, the need to you know uh, create a better um, uh, working future and a new way of management and leadership and one of the underpinnings of that, greater diversity. Um, now, ironically, as, as, as we know, diversity has actually not increased under COVID. Indeed, um, gender pay gap has gone backwards in many sectors. Um, uh, uh, there's still a real lack of um, ethnic diversity in leadership, um, as well as other kinds of diversity, disabled um, as well. Um, um, and yet, you know, we know that 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 um, diversity can help to build better leadership. So, so what are the challenges that leaders will be facing, and and how will diversity help to tackle those? Adam, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, if you if you think about the the, the barriers that we've seen previously in terms of the inclusivity of our workplaces, um, at the worst, we've had extreme prejudice. And at the best, we probably have had a lot of preconceived notions from managers and leaders who wanted to do the right thing, but thought, actually, you know what, this is just too difficult or too hot button an issue for me to address. And I think there have been too many accidental managers out there who not really thought about the benefit that that diversity and inclusivity can bring into their workplace and to their organization. Um, and some probably see it as an uncomfortable type of adjustment or change, and, and that's a barrier. So, you know, we, we, we know that there's a problem in the way that we recruit, you know, whether it's things like names on CVs triggering either conscious or unconscious bias amongst people, uh, those who recruit through their own networks rather than through the widest possible array of channels, or mm -hmm. those of us who at some point in our management journey have fallen into the trap of recruiting in our own image rather than looking for someone who brings a different point of view. Um, I think working patterns have also been a barrier. People haven't been intelligent enough about job design right at the very beginning to say, actually, this job could be done differently, which would open it up to a wider talent pool or different sort of candidates than we've seen perhaps in the past. Um, and also confidence, I think, has been a huge barrier. Um, I don't know about you and Daisy, but you know, I, I for one, often uh, suffered from imposter syndrome, despite having been pretty successful in my career. And I think many people um, who might increase the diversity of an organization in so many ways do feel that however skilled they are, that they don't have what it takes to thrive in a particular workplace or environment. So there are barriers both on the side of the organization doing the recruiting and on the side of the individual. And we need to work together and bust all of those collectively. Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Now, if we do tackle some of these barriers, um, um, how will that help, Daisy? How does that, how does it make us better managers and leaders? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just going to say to to Adam's point, I I do think this this thing around kind of inertia. Um, to deal with some of these changes uh, is a real challenge. And I think there has to be an understanding amongst managers, leaders, employees, organizations that we won't get everything right first time. And it's okay to test and fail and change the way you do things. Um, and, uh, and actually it's never been more important to think about uh, kind of management practice as an iterative process <laughs> so um so you know hybrid working is a really good example we don't yet know what good looks like there, there seems like a new challenge every day like with adam dropping off the uh 
this dream, <laughs> this bad technology. But you know, you you kind of you learn through doing, and um, and if you have this kind of end goal in mind, which is how do I make my organization and my team resilient and um, how do I support their well-being and how do I support diversity because that makes my business better and it also creates, you know, it has, has positive knock-on benefits for the culture of my organization, um, then you can sort of learn <laughs> as you go. And, I, and uh, we obviously talk about that a lot because we're a professional body, but I do think that has never been more important. And we're hoping through this project that we will identify some more practical examples that can bring some of these challenges to life and help people to recognize at which point on the journey they are and what the next steps might be for them and how they can learn from others. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we have several themes because obviously diversity has many forms. So we're going to be exploring um, gender, obviously, and, and, and also sexuality, exploring ethnicity, um, exploring disability, um, social social mobility, and, and indeed age. Um, do you think that these barriers are, that prevent us from being more inclusive are common? Are they different? Um, is it a combination? Um, Adam, what are, what are your thoughts around that question? Well, Anne, and with my apologies for falling off the stream a couple of minutes ago, um, I'd, I'd say it's a combination of the two. I think when you look across uh, different aspects of the agenda, you'll find some common threads, some common barriers facing uh, individuals with, with different differences, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, but then there are some very specific ones as well. Um, you know, if I think of my own personal experience as, you know, a, an LGBT individual in management and, and leadership, one thing that uh, a lot of gay people face is they have to come out all the time in the workplace. It happens over and over and over again in workplace relationships. And that is part of their journey through um, their working lives. That will be different to someone who perhaps faces barriers to inclusion because of geography or social mobility, for example, or because of gender. So every every characteristic, every difference can have some very specific things as well. What I think in common is a need for resilience, a need for coping strategies, and a need to be able to talk to and work with others who've been on that journey before as well. Um, and if we, as we work through um, the, the, the research and the policy work and the thought leadership that Daisy and others across CMI are going to be leading over the next year, I think we can come to some very practical recommendations that individual managers and leaders can take forward, as well as say some things to those that run our country about how they could make things easier so that we can get the 21st century management and leadership that we want. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a great point. And Daisy, what's your view on you know, how similar or different are the barriers? Adam actually gave a great example there about, you know, having to constantly come out. Um, but what are, what are your thoughts about, you know, the importance of similarities, differences um, and the, uh, regarding these barriers? Yeah, so, uh, so as Adam mentioned, we are, we, we're splitting up some of the discussions into differing areas so that we can drill down into um, each of those topics and, and identify the, some of those specifics. But as we know, there's going to be lots of cross-cutting um, issues, you know, across the piece. Um, so I think it's just something that we need to be very aware of. And this is a, a chance to explore it in a, in a, you know, workplace management and leadership context. And as Adam says, come up with some of those very practical, tangible examples so that we can make it clear where, uh, an approach can be organization wide and where it needs to be more targeted and also how that might affect how you evaluate the interventions that you put in place to to kind of bring more inclusivity into your workplace. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think those are all um, very important points. And of course, um, it, Part of the issue is what are the frameworks that allow us to make progress and make people understand that there's still a lot more to do. Um, and so some, I know some people have had, uh, have mooted the point or the made the point. Um, is it, it, do we need to move beyond calling this whole area 
um, E, D, and I, right? So are we actually capturing the real need um, to um, make this a core part of, of management and leadership, or um, are we, by calling it E, you know, E, D, and I, parking it somewhere on the side? And I can see we've lost Adam again. So I'm going <laughs> to ask you that question, Daisy. What do you, what do you, what do you think? And um, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see that risk um, when we've been speaking to senior leaders about it. It is a concern that people may switch off if you're talking about some of these interventions in an, in an, under the banner of EDI. Whereas really, this is fundamental to how we lead and manage, and and it's fundamental because it leads to better business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's something we definitely need to be aware of. I'd also be really keen to know what others' thoughts are on the um, listening into this stream. So please do drop it in the chat if you have a, a, a particularly strong feeling towards it. I guess the other thing is, it uh, there is a risk. I guess if you if you just subsume it in leadership practice, that it gets lost, and we don't want that to happen. So there's probably a balance to be had. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, um, but I do see leaders trying to redefine some of these areas. Um, and I do have some empathy for that. I know that in our um, earlier discussion this week, um, one one leader was basically saying how his colleagues, when you mentioned the EDNI word, you know, he, he said, oh, I can see the eyes glazing over. Um, and, and, you know, that's obviously a sign that People think, oh, we've we've been there and done that. We've we've uh, solved this issue, but clearly we haven't solved this issue. Or they might think that EDNI is, you know, simply another chapter of quote unquote wokeness, um, mm -hmm. rather than, as you say, something that's absolutely essential and integral to modern management and leadership. Um, which actually is ironic because that's what the evidence base is suggesting that diversity of thought delivers, as you rightly said, better business outcomes and, and, and inclusive cultures unlock productivity, unlock happiness and loyalty. So there's every reason for organizations um, to truly uh, uh, embrace this whole aspect. Um, and, and now he's back again. So Adam, I was asking, what are your what are your thoughts on whether or not we should call this ED and I or whether we need a new moniker to describe what we're trying to do here? Well, I I, I do think Anne that we need to start talking about 21st century leadership in a much more holistic way. Um, rightly or wrongly, there are people out there who are in leadership positions and positions of power who see ED&I, which so many of us care about, as somehow politicized or as somehow not inclusive of everyone. And whilst I think that's really unfortunate because, you know, who could say equality is ever, is ever politicized in that way? Equality is really important to us all. Um, I'd, I'd rather find the terminology that lets everyone be involved and let everyone see that this isn't just something that you do off the side of your desk. Um, but is actually really at the heart of what your business or organization is and what you are trying to achieve. Um, the journey that I think is most similar, and my apologies if Daisy has perhaps already raised this, um, is around uh, ESG, uh, environmental, uh, social and governance uh, reporting and things like that. It used to be the thing that was over in the corner of the desk as corporate social responsibility or something like that, mm -hmm. um, but has moved to being right at the heart of business purpose and business strategy over the last few years because the customer at the end of the day and the shareholder demanded it. I think we need to demand the same thing about equality, diversity and inclusion. And if what that takes is changing the language that we use about it, a little bit in order to bring more people into the tent. Let's do it. And let's just talk about management and leadership that gets the best out of everyone uh, and, and use that as our springboard to success. Absolutely. And indeed, um, there are some leaders redefining it. I know uh, Paul Pullman, who's been a leading voice in this uh, space for a number of years, um, has, is starting something he's calling net positive which is basically uh, saying that businesses should solve more problems than they create. <laughs> and, you know, he's aiming that at what he's um, identifying, which I think many people would certainly agree with him as the two biggest 
um, social um, issues, which are inequality um, and um, sustainability. Um, so he is looking for um, new words to um, breathe new life and impetus. And that's just an example. So I think uh, we will absolutely be open to that. And of course, those of you listening to this conversation, if you have thoughts on uh, what, what we should be doing uh, or what that should be called, please do let us know, put them in the chat. Um, we will certainly consider them. Um, but of course, uh, we all need leaders ultimately um, to inspire us. I mentioned Paul Pullman, I worked with him earlier in, in my career and I certainly find him inspiring. Um, which leaders inspire you and have inspired you in your careers? Um, maybe starting with you, Daisy, and then on to Adam. So I have been lucky enough to work with a few leaders who have really inspired me. Um, and when I say inspired, I think of it in the sense of really building my confidence from quite a low base, I think, and giving me room to test and fail um, and uh, challenging me to try new things and helping to spark my creativity. So very much a sort of nurturing coaching role um, being really, really important. Um, and then also I think not taking themselves too seriously and maintaining a good sense of humor, you know, um, work, we, we all have to work. Um, but we want to have a life and we want to enjoy our work. Most people want to enjoy their work. Um, and I think having a having some perspective and a good sense of humor really helps with that and also creates a safer space to test things out and to learn. Um, I'm certainly someone who learns through doing. I know other people don't necessarily work in that way, but that really helped me. And I try a lot in my professional practice to try to bring a bit of that to my my day-to-day -day work. Um, but I think I will always remember those people for creating that safe space for me and encouraging me probably. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting point um, because when we were talking with Tara Alice about her research, The Boss Factor, she found that actually for the vast majority of people, their line manager has the greatest impact on their well-being and their um, uh, their life outside of work. And, you know, what she was saying is we often don't consider enough the impact that our boss has on us outside of our working hours. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're talking about is a, for you, a good boss is somebody that gives you confidence and gives you space to fail and to grow and to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but Adam, which, what about you? Which leaders have inspired you uh, during your career and what were their characteristics? Gosh, I, I just want to build on one of Daisy's points, Anne, first, if I may. I couldn't agree more about sense of humor uh, and not taking yourself too seriously. Um, you know, I've always been a pretty driven person. Uh, in, and, and in those who have had, whether it's the benefit or the disbenefit of uh, uh, being under my management and leadership, know that I really want to achieve results. But there's nothing that says that you can't be nice bring joy, bring happiness, bring optimism, and, you know, not take it all too seriously in the process. And I think a lot of leaders, particularly in this country, have difficulty with that. They think that leadership means being buttoned up. It means being unemotional in certain ways. And I think all of us are starting to learn that that vulnerability, that openness, and that ability to laugh and not take yourself too seriously is really important. So I couldn't agree more with what Daisy said there. In terms of my own sort of leadership um, uh, sort of idols, as it were. Funnily enough, and if I mentioned their names right here and right now, no one would know any of them because they're not household names. They're low ego individuals who make leadership about the mission of the organization and about the individuals that they work with rather than about themselves. Yeah. Now, you know, I have a certain degree of respect for, I guess, the sort of famous entrepreneur type, you know, the Richard Branson or the Elon Musks of the world. They achieve a hell of a lot, but they have a certain sort of sheer force of charisma in what they do, but, but they don't inspire me personally because I don't think they're visibly pulling others up the career ladder with them. The story is all about them. So I reserve my greatest respect for the sort of a small circle of people who I think quietly make it about 
themselves and others together at the same time. And I have a few people in my life who I call my peer mentors, and they're people of a similar age or career stage to me where we meet up regularly and help each other solve problems or see a different route through to success. And, and, and that's what really, really gives me some of my best leadership lessons, peers and low ego individuals who, who really give their all. Um, not the ones that you see on television and definitely not the ones you see on Dragon's Den or things like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, these are excellent points you're both making and some uh, good advice there with, you know, teaming up with peers and um, uh, sharing sharing uh, problems and, and solutions, which I think uh, those listening can, can certainly action. Um, well, but actually we will be speaking with a number of leading lights um, that are uh, leaders and CEOs of the 21st century as part of our 75th anniversary series. And we've got some great people lined up, including Paul Coleman, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but we are open. We'd like to hear from you. Who do you admire as a 21st century leader? Who embodies some of the characteristics that uh, Daisy and Adam have been touching on in terms of leading the way for creating um, high trust and authentic and inclusive workplaces that really get the best from people. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so please, um, if you have some suggestions, send them in to us or put them in the chat um, and uh, do let us know. And um, on that note, obviously this project will engage many of our CMI communities, including uh, our CMI companions and um, we, we have a, a, a special 75th council to help us with this work that we're doing um, that we've been discussing on this broadcast. Um, and we want really as many of our members and partners and our CMI community to get involved as, 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 um, as we're able to, to, to do. So um, Daisy, how can those listening get involved? How can people contribute to this 75th? Yeah, so as Anne mentioned, we're really looking for your input. Um, anyone can uh, contribute to the project. You just need to sign up to become a friend of CMI and you can do that via the link, which I think is in the chat, but it's um, www.managers.org.uk forward slash 75 years. Um, we, we're particularly interested because we've talked a lot about examples. So we're particularly interested in views from people who have lived experiences um, of diversity in the workplace, either good or bad, experiences of managing diverse teams, um, experience of being involved in projects to enhance diversity and inclusion and build a, a stronger inclusive culture. Um, any of those examples would be great. Please do share them with us. We, we genuinely want to use them to share with others and improve professional practice and um, all the other details should be on that web page that we're also running a number of surveys which you can also contribute to which take about 10 minutes to fill in and we would love to have your views super um and uh i know as well uh that uh we are having our first um, one of these discussions we're changing the time it's going to be next wednesday at noon and we're looking for a new name um so whether that's cmi's 75th um a, a conversation with leaders which is not perhaps the best name um, but we are looking for a new name please do suggest that we do have a question um, from Daryl and and Daryl says happy 75th CMI I think it's great that you'll be looking at issues around age disability social mobility will CBI sorry CMI be open to partnering with others on this well Adam what do you reckon uh, I mean, there's so many organizations doing great work and so many individuals doing great work in this space. And very often, um, no one organization starts off an idea. It's something that builds like a snowball over time. So getting together and using collective voice and collective force in order to achieve change is, is great. So I think there will be opportunities for both individuals and organizations to link up with CMI uh, over the course of uh, the project and over the course of the next year. Great, well, we have one more question, and this is from Amy. Um, great that you're asking people to get involved in the 75th. What are the outputs going to look like, and how and when will people be able to access them? Well, that is 
A great question, Amy. Daisy, what would you say to, to Amy? So um, the, uh, there are going to be myriad outputs. Um, as Anne already mentioned, we're going to be continuing these live discussions, albeit at a different time, um, where we'll hear from senior leaders doing interesting things. Um, we are also collating evidence. So I mentioned the um, polls that we're running and also opportunities to submit case studies. Um, and we'll be, uh, you know, analyzing all of that and producing it into a useful resource. And, and there will definitely be a practical output to that. It won't just be like a research paper, um, which we will publish, I think, um, in, in the middle of next year between um, March and June next year sometime. And then uh, we'll be thinking about interim outputs in the meantime. And to the point about partnership, you know, we're always really keen to learn from others and share experiences. So we may be doing some podcast episodes or we may be just doing some articles or, um, you know, really kind of open and flexible. Uh, so if you have an opportunity for us to share, then let us know and we'll see if we can do something with it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we would love to hear from you. And our last point comes from Mario. And he says, it's great that rather than focusing on history, you're using the big birthday to look to the future. But please tell me that you'll be spending some time celebrating this landmark. A party, maybe. <laughs> well, Mario, of course, we'll be throwing a 75th birthday party. Thank you for that wonderful suggestion. So thank you to Adam and to Daisy for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you both for leading this work with your teams. And thank you, everybody listening. Please do contribute. If you enjoyed this or want to get involved, you can consider joining CMI as a member. Um, so please do find out how you can sign up in the chat. And I will see you Wednesday next week at noon for the new version of my 75th Conversations. My first is with uh, a, a great leader, um, and a great champion for what we've been talking about, Teddy Niasha, who is the CEO of One Family. So thanks for joining us. Happy Friday, everybody, and have a great weekend.